Uh, well, appreciate the opportunity. I see Dr. Akbani on there. Uh, I obviously know uh, Greg very well and, and Bobby Slack. It's always an honor when I get this email to, to at least offer my time and, and try to help uh, with part of your education. I love being part of this curriculum each year. It's just a really, uh, I think San Diego Spine Foundation is one of the top tier education programs in the, in the country, obviously. And even though I didn't have a chance to train there, I think it's fun to be a part of it now uh, in, in at least a limited sense. So um, I'm Brandon Carlson. I'm from University of Kansas. Uh, my senior partner has been friends with uh, Dr. Akbarnia for a long, long time. Dr. Akbarnia actually knew one of our more senior partners, Dr. Asher, for a long time, and you can see his name on there. And and we we kind of um, keep his memory alive with the the namesake of our comprehensive spine center. So I'll uh, kind of click through this. The the topic obviously today is metabolic bone disease and how we we as surgeons sort of need to think about and and manage these patients. I do have disclosures, but none are uh, relevant to this talk. Obviously, I don't. I certainly don't have any disclosures for the brand names of the medicines that I'll talk about. So it's obviously a very widely spread and highly prevalent uh, disease process. We're seeing it more and more. Actually, uh, this is old data. This is 2007 when they when they uh, did a, a huge census poll and looked at over 200 million people had metabolic bone disease worldwide. And then in 2016, a report of 2010 census data actually showed that, you know, you see rates here of 10.3% of the population had osteoporosis and upwards of 40% had low bone mass. This was actually updated recently with another study looking at a limited sample 2017-2018 census data, and you can see it published in 2021, but they saw similar rates, right? So 43% low bone mass or any metabolic bone disease. Obviously, it was higher in women. That's uh, consistent with the disease process, and it's highest in women of over 65 years of age. And ironically enough, most of these patients are having spinal conditions, and they show up in our clinic. You can see here, same paper, 12.6 percent. So you're seeing that it, it is actually a little bit increased or a little bit higher. Granted, it's a small sample at the 2017-18 census data, and once again, highest in women over 65 years of age. In the spine population, I've referenced these papers before. Kang did a really nice study on this. They showed that, you know, from a CT measured Hounsfield unit study, it also had a DEXA. They showed 19.5% of patients had osteoporosis and 30% had osteopenia. And you put those two together, it's almost 50% of these patients over 50 years of age have abnormal bone mass or bone mineral density, I should say. That's a lot. And then I did a paper uh, back when I was a fellow. Same kind of concept. We use QCT, though it's a little higher uh, accuracy in measuring and, and classifying patients. And we saw 15% osteoporosis, 43.6% osteopenia. This is a little bit more consistent with the, the census data I just showed you. But boy, that's a lot. Like two thirds of patients over 50 years had abnormal bone mineral density. And, and I don't know about you guys in San Diego, but this is most of my patients. So it's pretty, pretty alarming to me that two thirds of them will will have some sort of abnormal bone architecture or bone mass uh, problem. I think it's important to emphasize the, the definition. I, I ran this talk by my residents or I gave it to them a, a few weeks ago and just understanding that the actual diagnosis just means that the, the living tissue of bone is uh, degrading in a way that generalized ske skeletal fragility in which both the density and the quality are low enough that low trauma or weak, uh, low energy trauma or minimal trauma, they say here, can cause a fracture. So that's the, the premise is that osteoporosis, osteopenia is just evaluating your risk for a fracture. So let's talk about that a little bit, density and quality. Density is the amount of minerals that are in the bone given a certain amount of volume. We call it bone mineral density, sometimes we call it bone mass, and it can be measured and used for diagnosis classifications. Bone quality is about how it's composed or the structure. It contrib contributes to the strength, but it's independent of the density, and it is affected by a lot of different things and shows, you know, we now have imaging modalities that can show microarchitectural changes, mineralization changes, and medications can uh, affect this in terms of how it modifies bone turnover. We don't really have a great way to measure bone quality, and we certainly don't use it for diagnoses yet. So let's talk about each one of these measurements because I think it's important as a surgeon uh, or even just a clinician, you should understand these in a way that you know how to implement them for your patients. So DEX is the oldest. It was a two-dimensional screening technique that was developed in the 60s. It's still considered the gold standard for screening for osteoporosis and, and osteopenia. It can be done at spine, wrist, or hip. Uh, it measures density. They actually quantify the, the two-dimensional uh, two picture. It looks at 
the uh, the attenuation and then it can give you a quantification. It's easy to repeat, uh, especially when looking at monitoring for um, response to treatments. You can repeat a DEXA and see how they change over time, but it can be overestimated in the lumbar spine in particular for degenerative changes as they have an increased uh, density in general, but it doesn't necessarily represent an increased quality in their bone. CT can be used. You can uh, measure hound field units. We know that this is really just a measurement of the bone attenuation on a CT scan. It's not really a measurement of bone density. I think that's an important delineation. We do use it as a surrogate of measures to sort of evaluate somebody's bone density or bone. Uh, uh, I'm saying density, but it's not density uh, at a certain level, and we do that a lot. I'm sure as uh, you've done cases with Greg and and. Bobby Slack and, and others at your program that you guys probably incorporate this into your pre-op evaluation because it's easy. You're already getting a CT scan. You put this uh, region of interest uh, over an area and you can kind of tell, all right, I'm going to stop my construct at L3. This number looks pretty good and you have less concern, but it doesn't really measure bone density. It can be more accurate in the degenerative conditions and it is opportunistic, which is a bonus because if you're getting a pre-op CT, you can certainly look for it. Better than that would be a QCT. This actually requires a software platform. They used to have uh, these um, phantoms that they would put under the patient. It would be used as a reference. So the, new, the known hydroxyapatite density underneath the patient could be then compared to the measurement on the CT. And that would then allow them to make a conversion factor. And that could show you what the actual volumetric bone density is. You can see these pictures over here on the right. It's truly volumetric because you're showing a region of interest and crisscrossing that with another region of interest in a different plane. So they actually can measure the volume. And it's much, much more accurate in terms of defining bone mineral density. So again, you look at these measures, they're in milligrams of centimeter squared of hydroxyapatite, which is a bone mineral density measurement. The ACR, American College of Radiology, believes this is so accurate that they've actually given their recommendations that these are the classifications and the criteria for how you measure uh, or, or diagnose someone. So if a QCT is, is given to a radiologist, they'll look at these numbers and then put the diagnosis in your, in your evaluation or your report. It does have high radiation. It is a different test. There's an increased cost for it. It's not widely available. And like, for example, I talk about this a lot and I believe in it. I had it in my fellowship, but we don't have it here yet. Well, who should we screen is kind of a bigger question. Uh, this is actually an interesting paper I found and just kind of updating this talk. It's uh, from this journal called Evidence Synthesis, which is uh, really ran by the uh, United States Preventive Health um, Task Force. If you have a, you know, I guess a weekend, I don't know, a 448 page report, it shows every single screening recommendation from 2008 to 2016 and their current status and every single literature uh, or, or every single journal article or literature that supports these screening uh, uh, protocols, which is, uh, it's a lot to digest, to be honest, but I try to keep it more simple because I'm not that, uh, I, I can't memorize that much of a paper. Um, so. You know, U.S. Preventive Services Tax Force, that's a government in entity that, that certainly makes high-level recommendations with the best research. And you see here they recommend women over 65 and postmenopausal post women that are younger than 65 are going to be at increased risk. Those are kind of their, their blanket, broad strokes, 30,000-foot view of who should get a screening test. I think the WHO does a better job of giving a little more guidance on this. And there's certainly these other protocols. Some of them are from endocrine societies. Some of them are from other countries. And I think that they also hone in on these other higher risk populations. Females over 65, men over 70, or anybody with a bone risk, bone disease risk factor, medication, smoking, alcoholism. This is all the stuff that probably is driving up our prevalence that we're seeing, you know, certain medications or changing how our, our bone turnover markers work. There's people that have cancer that get put on a different medicine that all of a sudden affects bone quality adversely downstream. So these are the ones that need to pop up in your head. These sort of have a high acuity when a patient comes in and talks to you about X, Y, or Z, then you should think, oh, they might have, they might have abnormal bone density. And certainly back to those patient papers I referenced, this is two thirds of your patients that walk in the door. So, uh, when we talk about elective spine surgery, now it's a common screening practice. And, and so it's sort of, we fall sort of out of the WHO recommendation, which would be more geared toward a primary care, but that's okay. I mean, we, we want to catch these people. It doesn't matter if you screen a little more aggressively, uh, especially for what's at stake when we go into our surgeries. So how do we do it? You can use DEXA again. That's probably the most widely used and available. The FRAC score, a fracture risk assessment tool. Again, these are questions that are have been validated and it's a it's a tool you can get online. 
go onto their website, you just Google Frax, you can enter these numbers. We have it integrated into our Epic EMR. I can type these things in, it's gonna show me their risk for fracture. And again, probably identify somebody that might be more likely to get some sort of pretreatment or some sort of higher attention before a surgery. You can notice though, what I think I really honed in on when I started using this is they, they only really care about femoral neck bone mineral density. That goes back to the DEXA score, probably being less accurate in the other zones of the body. You know, the spine, I kind of ignore it unless I need that low score in the spine to get some sort of medication approved. Uh, but I think femoral neck is the best metric that we can track. When patients have a total hip, you know, that's not going to be possible. So then I go to the wrist. Um, but this is one where the limit of the test is a little bit, the limitation of the test kind of drives this. So for DEXA, it's femoral neck. Uh, you can see here they even have the QCT on there. And people do QCTs on the femur as well. But I think that that's the best true value true evaluation of of people's uh, bone health bone strength that has the most validation for fracture risk so quantitative ct it's a um you know, the qct measurement it, it's been standardized at l1 and l2 you use this acr criteria you can do this volumetric measurement and then you can make a diagnosis uh, it can also be used at the femoral neck again you'd have to specify that and how you order the test to be used in the fracture assessment tool so then we talk about these other ones, and I think this is where this talks, the genesis of this talk a few years ago came from is, it was very confusing to me to sit in a meeting, one of these conferences I like going to, and people talking about these numbers. They're throwing numbers around, and I'm like, wait a second, that's a QCT number? Is that a Hounsfield unit number? I can't really figure this out. So Hounsfield units are very useful. Again, it measures attenuation, not density, but it does correlate in some studies with DEXA. There is some, uh, you see this paper here from Mike Kelly and his group, there is a, a lot of uh, controversy, though, whether it's truly accurate for the for the purposes of what we need it for to define a criteria of a categorization of a patient for osteopenia osteoporosis and pretreatment. So we've come up with a lot of different thresholds, and I created this table. DEXA has basically a standardized system, and we know the numbers. Everybody here on this talk is well versed in that. Maybe you hadn't heard of ACR criteria and the bone mineral density thresholds for diagnostic criteria from a QCT, but there they are, greater than 120, 80 to 120, less than 80. And then there's all these papers that throw around Hounsfield unit numbers that, boy, they certainly look a lot, they look similar, right? So they, these numbers are very close to the QCT, although they're completely different measurements. And you see that the one that I pull out the most is this 110. I think a lot of people reference that paper quite a bit it's 90 percent specific for diagnosing uh, low bone mineral density or bone mass or osteoporosis and it wasn't really necessarily driven off of someone who had a cage subside or fracture risk or fusion etc so that's probably the most conservative you can see it's one of the lower end but boy once again you start to sit in here and you're reading papers and you're like is it is it 110 QCT? Because that would be osteopenia, but 110 with Hounsfield is actually osteoporosis. So it's kind of confusing. I think it's important as a clinician, know what you're using, know how to use it, know what the number means or references, and um, and and then you can make that a powerful tool for yourself. You can see obviously that the WHO backs the DEXA, and they've always you know that's where the original data came from, and and any organization of that tier, if they put their name on it, it's got to have pretty robust findings and and a, a long track record. ACR, I think, is a reputable society or, or college, and and I think their criteria certainly make a lot of sense. And then we have all these other papers that are written one off or you know, retrospectively or, or through opportunistic screening protocols of like abdominal scans and all these, these other things. So again, just understand the number is important. It does mean something. I'm not saying it's it's insignificant or you shouldn't use it, but you know, where it came from and what those numbers truly mean is, is you know, comes from a lot of sources. So they're all useful tools. Like I said, I've kind of hit this already. DEXA will be the one that's most widely available, probably easiest to obtain and um, just know how you're going to incorporate it incorporate this information. So what about that quality thing we kept talking about? Uh, again, it's difficult to measure. This was a paper from Hanjo Kim up at HSS and really Emily Stein, she's an endocrinologist up there and she runs their bone mineral density or, or sorry, their metabolic bone program. And, and she was the person that really drove this, this paper. But they have this high resolution peripheral QCT thing, which looks at microarchitecture. And they found there, you know, again, very spine focused that they found the higher complication rates. So 
in, in spine fusion patients. So we know it's it's critically important how the microarchitecture looks and how it's how it functions, not just the density. Things that I use in a workup of a patient, osteoporosis, or I now call a metabolic bone disease labs. Vitamin D is always critical. Calcium and phosphate. I add PTH. I think PTH is a important metric when you understand what PTH does in your body and the feedback loop with vitamin D and calcium levels. It then becomes relevant to maybe pick out some unique patients that might have hyperparathyroidism driving their metabolic bone disease. Once you see those patients, they're easily treated if you have an ENT colleague that can take their parathyroids out. Uh, but you need that study, you need that number to really interpret the other numbers carefully. Most of these other studies are on a CMP, a basic lab, TSH, uh, you know, from a insurance approval standpoint, you might need to put in there, you know, suspected hyperparathyroidism or hyperthyroidism, something like that. Or if someone has a previous history of that, you know, then you could get it. Um, so what I kind of think about when I think about treating my spine patients is I need to be really suspicious that they are going to have abnormal bone mineral density almost every single time to a fault. And, you know, then what I figure out is well, why do they have it? Most people, it's just age related. And if it's age related osteopenia, osteoporosis, maybe I have a primary care endocrinologist treat it. Um, oftentimes, if they end up having an indication for some sort of instrumented fusion or instrumented spine procedure, then I'll go ahead and treat them. We have a, a infolded uh, clinic in our practice that is able to do that. I can talk about that if anyone has questions, but that's sort of faster pathway for our system. And um, But if they have another reason for it, hyperparathyroidism or some other disease process going on in their body, then I typically have endocrine help me out because they really are very careful in watching these other metrics and these other labs. And it can become sort of a burdensome process for me and the busy spine practice we have. So it's nice to have their support. Um, then it's all about evaluating well, what do they need? Is this a degenerative case, deformity procedure? Is this just cervical for myelopathy? How urgent is it? And then I sort of go into my algorithm of, well, if, if they need something, you know, X, Y, or Z, what are my treatment options or what should I do before their operation if, if necessary? There's a lot of papers on this kind of stuff in spine surgery. Um, there's um, certainly different uh, uh, approaches, I would say. There's been a lot of retrospective looks at these. And I think that this uh, paper in the bottom left, I'll talk about it in a second, is is a really nice consensus paper that was multi-center that I think gives us at least the current state. You know, it certainly highlights the deficiencies we have and where we probably should go as well. So for medication treatment, for example, uh, there's a lot of different statements on medications. And these medications, again, they're not designed for us, for spine surgeons. They're designed to de decrease fracture risk. So that's where they came from. And one of our first ones, and, and probably the better categorization rather than bisphosphonates now, would be um, anti-resorptives. So bisphosphonates are the first ones that came out. There's another medicine we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but there's a lot of different conflicting evidence in terms of spine cases or spine fusions that these medicines are helpful or that we want to use them. Um, so I kind of say this in my clinic, like these, that's not the medicines we're, we're wanting. Like patients will say, well, I have, you know, I have a primary care and they put me on uh, Boniva. And I'm like, well, that's, you're ready for spine surgery. That's not the medicine you need. When we start talking about the ones that we use most often, I'm sure you guys have all been a uh, I've seen these or worked with these. We talk about anabolic agents and the two that are out right now that FDA approved are Forteo and Timlos. And then we know from multiple studies now that these do increase our fusion potential um, and, and they're beneficial to these patients. There's other papers that have looked at comparing them to the bisphosphonates. We saw increased fusion rates with that 2012 paper, uh, decreased screw loosening. I think that's another kind of key component is you know, chicken and egg kind of thing is if your instrumentation loosens before you get your fusion, it's sort of that race to the end. And so if this helps our bone density, bone quality all improve to hold fixation better, then it could help with fusion rates. That might be the, the trickle down effect. But you can also see that even down to the level of insertional torque, that's a good metric, or at least we think it is of, of improving our bone quality, bone density. So they're widely used. We use them a lot now in deformity surgery. Again, I think that with your fellowship, I'm sure you've seen or encountered this. It's probably part of a standard practice protocol in terms of the deformity evaluation. And we use it before and after surgery. And there's a lot of evidence now supporting it. Um, again, looking back at this uh, sort of 
um, the insertable torque confusion group, well then we start to get into another medicine category that just came out or is more recent, this medicine called Avenity. It's a romosozumab, and it's, it's a little bit different mechanism of action. It goes after this target. It's an antibody to the sclerostin uh, protein. And we know it actually increases bone density and decreases resorption at the same time. So the bisphosphonates are the anti-resorptives, the anabolics are the increased density, and this one sort of does both through a different mechanism. Uh, typically, well, initially it was suggested as a medicine that for people that cannot tolerate other anabolic agents, for someone who's on Forteo that gets hypercalcemia, that's the easiest indication to get on Avenity. I will say now that this is actually easier to get approved than you might think. Uh, Medicare has an approval pathway for this, and it's an every 28 day subcutaneous injection. I've used it now extensively. Uh, I've got a lot of patients that have had surgery after having this. Um, so this is a very interesting and promising medicine. Interestingly, uh, just recently in 2021, this paper came out, which had nothing to do with our spine fusion patients, but it does show a very objective analysis of what does this medicine do to the spine architecture. And they used a, a standardized um, ARCH trial, had a, a group of postmenopausal women's with postmenopausal high risk women with osteoporosis. And then they had a group that went on Avenity. And they saw increases in volumetric bone mineral density, bone volume, mineral content, and strength. So it all improved over the uh, standard alendronate. So we know it's a good medicine. We know it works well, has a pretty low uh, risk profile as well. This is that paper I mentioned, the uh, multi center Delphi uh, approach with a lot of really top tier names here. I think this is a really important paper to read if you haven't read it before. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, when they do consensus statements, you know, they look at the best level of evidence and here's what they say. All patients over 65 should be considered, you, you know, for screening. That's the WHO recommendation. Anyone under, under 65 with risk, risk factors, DEX is still widely used. CT measured counseled units could be opportunistic. And here you go, this, this entire group and all the big believers, they didn't even have a consensus for the number. So maybe that 110 is the one you should use, maybe under 100, whatever you think. Anabolic agents are the first line treatment for people before elective spine surgery. There wasn't a, a lot of data on that Avenity product at this time. So I think that you're gonna see that in the next five years that more data comes out. They recommended minimum two months pre-op and six months post-op. I think you know, I'm almost at my time here, maybe one minute, we start a little bit late, but I think the entire paradigm of what you can do surgically and what happens after that pre-op evaluation, it could easily be another 30 minute, one hour talk, but I'll just briefly touch on some topics that are always talked about. Cement augmentation, it can work to increase screw pull out. I think that will help in someone with you know, compromised bone, might decrease loosening, might help your um, your fusion rates, et cetera, but it does transfer loads to the other leg segments. And I looked at a paper actually last night that showed that when you do that, you cement augment the top level of your construct, the next level up will have increased uh, degeneration quickly because of the rigidity that you're imparting. So be careful what you, what you decide. It might cause something different. It's definitely not the end all be all. PJK, the dreaded uh, complication for anyone doing deformity operations, uh, I think that alignment and correction goals are still a hot topic. We're making sure that we put these humans in the right position if their spine's going to be fused. Tethering, yes, no. There's more data coming out that maybe it does help, but in the osteoporotic patient, I don't know if that's going to be good or bad. Um, how far up you may or may not go with uh, something like a vertebroplasty. There's kind of conflicting evidence on this once again. Once we just talk about screw augmentation, maybe at the top of the construct, but how that might impact their adjacent segment can be really detrimental as well. So it's really highly debated topic. You can go to almost any meeting now, SRS, and this is always talked about. Um, BMP, we use it in off-label fashion for post-refusion, but I think it is critical for these patients to get a fusion. And if you do anterior inner bodies or anterior column support, you can certainly use it there as well. And you're going to probably improve, improve your potential for effusion and, and decrease complications that way. Um, service technology on implants, I think, is a hot topic as well. It's it's critical. I think they go hand in hand. And maybe one day we do get to the point where we can uh, modify or modulate bone growth through the surfaces of our implants. We're getting there, uh, but I still use BMP in these higher risk patients. Kate subsidence, uh, we can talk all day about this. You're, you're, you guys are all being, guys or girls are being trained with the masters of anterior column treatment, anterior column support. I think they're teaching you excellent uh, methodology to respect your implants, use a large footprint implant, things like that. These can have impact on 
fusion. It can have impact on uh, deformity correction, et cetera. What kind of material you use? Again, the modulus of elasticity with these patients in particular with compromised bone is going to be critical. Definitely don't overstuff your disc spaces or you might regret those types of situations. Uh, once again, though, it's not the only key factor. I think the whole evaluation and the pretreatment is probably more important. Hardware pullout, we talked about this, longer constructs, longer lumbar fusion cases, even shorter ones in people with compromised bones, iliac fixation can be critical or necessary to prevent complications. Cervical cases, uh, you know, going longer down into thoracic spine is sometimes necessary so they don't get that um, screw pull out, especially with lateral mass type fixation. Percutaneous screws might be useful, especially in these people. If you maintain all their soft tissue attachments, their, their uh, post retention band, I'm a big believer in that so using a, a good inner body and then and then some sort of perk fixation might have a better um, risk profile but there's not a strong body of literature nor a consensus statement on this either uh, post-op care i think is uh, critical these people stay on these agents sometimes it's for six months sometimes it's for a year my my approach is that i i still keep them on that and then i have them get engaged with an endocrinologist after that time point i try to save them another year so if, if the fda approval is two years i might only finish out for one year and put them on uh, denosumab which everyone knows is prolia it's a, a once every six months injection anti-resorptive again i don't necessarily love the bisphosphonates anymore but i keep them on something to try to maintain what they did get back proper nutrition I think is all uh, kind of bundled into this that if, if they're a malnourished patient they're not going to be able to grow bone period and recheck their dex as i follow these people or have our clinic that does osteoporosis because really you might change this patient's life in the next 10 years by preventing fragility fractures so i think that that's another element that just because you fixed their radiculopathy for their one level spondy you really could have a huge impact for their longevity and their livelihood uh, and morbidity lifetime uh, by preventing future fragility fractures so Kind of in summary, high suspicion. Everybody who walks in the door, I think of them as having, you know, abnormal bone, especially the patients that need surgery. We start screening them right away or find out did they had a DEXA in the last six months to a year. Anybody who needs an anabolic agent, we have a fast path to getting them that. I use Avenity now also. Uh, fragility fractures, again, this is like the crux of the whole thing. The diagnosis is telling you what the risk is, and you should be cognizant of the fact that you have a big impact on that. Just two seconds on this last part. Um, you're learning from the masters of how to build culture and build friendships and and, and be good stewards in the world. Dr. Akbarnia uh, certainly embodied that, and that's where I think Greg and 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 Bob have have uh, kept that moving forward. Uh, I'll tell you, just having known Greg and Bob and Dr. A for a while, uh, you know, they they've taught me to do the same thing. So, and I didn't even attend their fellowship, but they've had a huge impact on me. This top left corner picture is my entire. Uh, team. I host a Christmas party every time, uh, every year, and this is everybody from clinic to OR to the guy who swept the force between the cases. So, you know, don't don't be above supporting people and telling them their worth and don't be above uh, letting them know that and doing something special for them. And you can see here, Greg and Leslie is, you know, when we go to meetings, we love to get together and, and this is Jay Kumar and then this is a, a new attending at the HSS. We just all had dinner. You know, we, we love making memories like that. Anyone who wants to come visit in Kansas City and see the Harrington archives, I'll take you to a KU game if you if you love to do that kind of stuff. We have a, a world class stadium here. Allen Fieldhouse cannot be beat in terms of its uh, a way of uh, the, um, how, how fun that environment is for a, for a game. So I'd love to do that for you if you ever wanted to come out. It's an open door policy. Just reach out. Greg has my number and um, bottom right picture here is just a, a little bit of a shout out. That's my senior partner. Um, I'm not sure if you all know, I know, I know Dr. A knows, but um, he's battling brain cancer right now. So, you know, keep him in your thoughts, make memories right now when you can. Um, he's he's a huge mentor. He's a huge friend to you guys. Uh, he's been around a long time, but um, he's he's fighting hard and he's doing well right now. But um, that's kind of just my last plug is you, you, it's never too late you, or it's going to be too late if you wait too long. Just go make memories now and, and, and love the people around you. So uh, at that point, I'm a little over time. Sorry. Uh, what kind of questions you guys all have for me? Great talk, Brandon. Thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. That was really awesome. Apropos talk. Hey, can you uh, just comment real, <clears throat> real quick about your uh, clinic workflow and you know what you have in place for these patients? You said that you're able to, you know, send these patients kind of to a place in your clinic that takes care of osteoporosis is that run by family medicine or internal or endocrine or 
Yeah, absolutely. We you? actually have a we have an infolded nurse practitioner. We sent her to a few courses and there's really no certification for this. You just got to know the workflow and the, the proper workup and then also uh, medication monitoring. She has dedicated clinic space and time in our spine center, which is critical, I think, to uh, quick access. Our endocrine department, love them to death. They're awesome and the clinicians are fantastic, but their wait time's about six months. And for some of these patients, that's not reasonable. They need three months of treatment to have surgery in six months, you know, so uh she's uh she's excellent she likes doing it it's a revenue stream actually she does pretty well with billing and and workups we have relationships with the two companies forteo and timos in particular we get a lot of samples from them she knows the process or the workflow i could certainly share what she goes through if you guys wanted it of sort of the criteria for approvals of these medicines how to kind of work that system a little bit you got to have the right numbers, the right metrics. If you've got any x-ray at any point along the way where there's a evidence of a fragility fracture, you can get an approval. You know, these medicines are expensive and some people's policies, they just don't support it. But you have the right buzzword on the paper or the right way of writing your report. Next thing you know, you can get these pretty readily and, and some people's co-pays are zero for them. Avenity for us is actually managed by our health system, which is interesting. They, they put it in one of their infusion clinics because there's a there's a protocol for how they can do that medicine. It's a subcutaneous, but you have to be monitored for like 15 or 30 minutes after. So they saw that as a facility fee revenue generator, so to speak. And I don't know what you guys have at Scripps, but that might be something to talk about is if you have some other infusion center where people go for, um, you know, their, their chemo agent or something like that, they could pick up a Venity very quickly, which is kind of great because that infusion center has its own pre-cert process. So when I do it now, I just go into Epic and I, I order the medicine. I know the criteria that are necessary, like risk of fracture or having had a fracture, failed another anabolic treatment or failed another bisphosphonate and sustained a fracture. Really what I want it for is pre-op treatment. But then it's easy for them to follow the, the dots, so to speak, put it all in their report and their pre-cert team handles everything. So then my patients basically get on their schedule within a week or two, they start getting the medicine and three months later, we can talk about surgery. Wow. Very impressive. Wow. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds nice. I mean, Brandon, at least locally, even if I can get the Forteo, and we've had, I've had great experience with anabolics, but even if I can get Forteo approved, a lot of folks like the copay is still prohibitive yeah so that continues to be a barrier for us here at least but i don't know it uh, sounds like you've got it really uh, locked in brandon how are you handling males uh I have more trouble with with the males yeah, Tim, well, I didn't put that in there. I should have put it in there and bottled, edit my talk as soon as I get off. I'm sorry. That's the only one you can do in males, unfortunately. And yeah, that's harder for sure. Um, most of them are on some Medicare policy. And then we kind of nitpick and look for, you know, did they ever have some sort of suspected fracture? They have a subsided implant or for revision, you know, you name it. I have done a peer to peer. I don't do it often. It's not really time. It's not valued time. It's it's hard for me to, to get on all that stuff. My nurse practitioner actually do most of that for us. But if we can find some criteria and get the right clinician on the peer to peer, we've gotten it approved quite often. Um, some of them, maybe back to, to Hani's point, you know, they're co they tell us their copay is eight thousand dollars, you know, for whatever. And that's not going to work. Right. So we work pretty closely with them to try to get at least enough samples to get them lined up for an operation. And maybe there's like an in-between, there's there's a rebate program with Forteo, where they can, the company will support them for a while, and then we try to get them at least through the surgery part. And you're hitting on all the hard, yeah, I mean, this is the toughest part, and especially with the Venity, you know, now, now that I know that at least in women, uh, with, with the right criteria, I can get that done pretty quickly. And we're leveraging the workforce that's already doing all the, the pre-cert for us. So my nurse loves that. She still sees them in clinic, but we go send it to them. They take care of it. So men is Timlos, and sometimes it's just samples. They're obviously more rare because of the incidence, the difference in the prevalence rates in between men and women. But yeah, great, great point there. Yeah, the, the one other issue, and I'll, I'll stop talking because I know we're late, is um, with Avenity, which I also have been using more, I'm, I'm getting more pushback from our endocrinology team about using it in women over 65, and there's a cardiac risk concern, which I, I'm not sure is totally legitimate, but anyway, the, those are the pushbacks that you may see for yeah. those of you who haven't used it. Good point.
if you've been using it, have you seen, I've noticed a, a pretty impressive difference in the insertional torque. I, I don't oh, know, yeah. I can't quantify it. I think we need a study on that for sure. If you, I mean, we, maybe our center should talk about that, but um, I mean, I've done plenty of Forte on Tim Lowe's and, and I had this woman, she actually got hypercalcemia. So she went on the Avenity path. It was the first one I had. And I'll tell you, I mean, she was severely osteoporotic and I was putting screws in that were squeaking. And I sat there and I was like, wasn't this woman on a medicine? Yeah, and I remembered yeah. it. And so I think yeah. there's something there. I just don't know what to make of it yet. Right. Yeah, I know. It's hard, I it's hard to evaluate insertional yeah. torque, right? Because you don't know if there's a false reading in there somewhere. <clears throat> and uh, in other words, uh, we don't have a baseline, right? So you don't know comparing that person to itself before a entity. You know, maybe that their bone, that their uh, scoliosis or their bone or whatever their spine is, you know, hard for other reasons, but they still have osteoporosis, you know, right? Right. Bone, bone mineral disease. So, mm -hmm. um, and then real quick, last question: How long do you uh, keep them on pre-op? Are you a three-monther, six-monther? Is it dependent on the bone density? You know, do you change your mind based on how severe the osteoporosis is? <laughs> Yes and yes. Uh, minimum three for me. That's just kind of what I was taught and trained. Even with that consensus statement of two, I still just think three. My patients are okay waiting that long. Um, I don't have a hard evidence-based reason for that. But yes, Greg, uh, if if I see someone like, you know, they're minus two nine, some of those people, I want them on it for a year. Or I want to see at least an uptick or an, a slight improvement that they're trending in that direction. The way I described the patients, I said, we need to turn your bone machine around. We need to make it grow bone and be going in that direction in a positive sense before I can go in there and make sure that you're going to heal this thing. I actually just had a conversation two weeks ago with uh, a very, a very, very smart and young endocrinologist in our uh, hospital. She said there's a, and I'm going to look into this. I didn't want to put it in there yet because the only paper she sent me was in cystic fibrosis patients, but there's actually a uh, TBS, tra trabecular bone score, that they are looking at closer or more closely in the lumbar spine in particular to evaluate response to treatment. And it's the same premise that like the, the huh. true DEXA itself, the T-score, isn't showing a change, but they see this TBS go up, so they know it's working. And I think there might be something there. So I don't know, that might be something down the line that if, if I said, all right, you got to be on it three months, and then we're going to check your TBS, you know, to see. And if you really still need to push somebody in that direction further, maybe that's the severe osteoporotic before a tender pelvis. You know, I kind of have a weird subjective, completely subjective, you know, one level fusion, that's three months. Tender pelvis, well, we might need to do it for six. And I don't have a great way of saying that that's right or wrong. It's just my approach. The TBS is through the same CT or you need micro CT? The QCT is the same CT. The software company is out of Texas. It's just a software platform. It actually uses the quality check data on every CT scanner that they do like once or twice a week as the base. And then they can convert to hydroxyapatite based on an algorithm. It's pretty slick. So you really don't need anything else but a software. And I actually, I'm still working through my radiology department. The radiologist can use it as a revenue generator. If you say, here's my CT scan for pre-op, and oh, by the way, run it through the Mindways QCT thing. They can then quantify and report out diagnosis of osteopenia, and that's a billable event. So we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Hey. It's a, it's kind of billable like they could read a DEXA. If they read a DEXA and they interpret the score and then they tell you they have osteopenia, they, they can bill for that. Well, the radiology that department separate, here. It's a separate report, you know, Brandon? Correct. Or is it yep. the same? So it's like a, there's a, there'll be a CT scan interpretation. Yep. And then a separate QCT report. Yep. I might have a copy of one from my fellowship. It showed the, the pictures I had up there of where the region of interest was is is in that report. It almost looks kind of like a DEXA where you got a little picture in the corner and then they show you the density measurements and then they yeah. show you the mean yeah. and then they say, here's the criteria and then they say, here's the diagnosis. So Look. I'm always looking for pathways like that that are simpler that the institution will buy in on because I, I we want this tool, but you know, when you just sell them, it's more expense or you got to buy the software. They don't necessarily agree. But then you put it in their terms. And you say, well, radiology can use this to bill and yada, yada, yada. And then it's a win win. So uh, I don't know. We haven't got there yet, but I think that's a pathway some people could explore. Well, Brandon, thank you. 
Fantastic talk as always. Good yep. having you. Good to see you guys. Give, give, uh, Thanks, give Brandon. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. Great talk. Thank